Today's seminar uh, is about tenement inspections. Exciting, eh? Um, anyway, I'm going to give a, a short uh, talk first of all, and then uh, two other speakers are going to join me later. Um, the one thing I want to say, I want to thank uh, Safe Deposit Scotland for funding the training program. Uh, thank you, Safe Deposit Scotland. And also, when you've got questions uh, during the talk, uh, just put the questions, uh, put your questions in the chat box to the right hand side. Um, it's quite easy done. And in fact, you could I'd encourage you to say hello and, you know, so that we know you're there um, in the chat box. Uh, and, and at the end, we'll answer, try to answer the questions as best we can. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I think because the uh, pre-recorded session actually introduces the two speakers, I'll, I'll leave it to the pre-recorded session. My name is John Gilbert and I work with Annie Flint on underoneroof.scot, which is the website which has been set up to uh, help with the maintenance of and management of tenements. And you'll find lots of information there about anything I talk today about. So go there if you've got difficulties. Um, I'll also be talking with Scott Abercrombie, who was from my old practice. He's a conservation accredited uh, architect, and he has got a lot of experience in tenement surveys. And we'll be uh, asking him about what you can expect uh, from a professional survey. Uh, I hope that'll be interesting, and he may comment on some of the slides I, I'm showing today. Also, Victor McKay of Balmore Specialist Contracts, uh, he's going to be telling me more about drone surveys, a uh, very useful uh, technique, and rope access. Uh, we hope we'll get something on that. Uh, but the main topics uh, today are going to be, there are five different topics, how and what to survey. Um, now, in future webinars, uh, I hope to cover roofs and uh, gutters. So uh, I'm not dealing with that today. I will touch on gutter problems today, but not in any great detail. When to get a professional survey, obviously Scott will talk about that. Although later on, we hope to get uh, a, a webinar on dealing with builders. Uh, which is relevant to getting a professional survey. The other topics here, different survey techniques, how long, long elements will last, and what is the most important. Uh, and in the latter case, what is most important, again, another webinar on structural defects and stone repairs, that will come uh, later. So I won't be dealing very much with that. I will touch on some obvious structural problems today, but otherwise uh, those are the topics we're going to try to discuss. It's worth knowing about some of the elements that we're going to talk about today, like the mutual chimney and the mutual skew, which uh, form a fire break between the two properties, the flashing uh, at the uh, joint of the slate or tiles and the skew. Then uh, there's the ridge and parapets, of which there are many different types. The mullion, which is a small slender bit of stone between two windows. Sill and string courses, which help throw water off the face of the stone, quite important. Orioles, which start from the uh, first floor, and bays, which go down to the ground. Obviously, there's certain items you can check from the ground using binoculars. And this is just an idea of the sort of thing you can look for if you step into the street and get your binoculars out. Like dampness behind downpipes, you know, if that's... Uh, you, obviously you can see uh, leaks uh, emerging because the stone will be stained, so that is something you need to look at. Also you get uh, under the gutter and the stone uh, on the chimney head, you want to inspect that, both from the front and the rear. And finally, you might want to look at any structural cracks uh, or bulges. However, I would say that uh, if you're doing this or wanting to do any and survey yourself, you're better using uh, a professional to do it, even using binoculars, because they'll know what to look for. Um, they'll have that experience. 
the sort of thing that you would see from the ground are obviously the gutters. Here we diff have the different types of gutters. Cherry picker is the one way of really looking at your building. Certainly to look at the front building, front stonework and the gutters and the chimney heads, uh, as well as the condition of slating and flashing, because you can move about in a cherry picker. Cherry pickers come in all sorts of sizes, so different heights uh, will need a different footprint of cherry picker. So you probably need uh, council approval to put up a cherry picker and you might have to do the work on a Sunday uh, ensure, to ensure there's no disturbance to traffic. It's operated from a cradle, uh, either from an operator on the cradle or at ground level. Uh, from the the lorry uh, that the, the the cradle is on. Uh, now the other way of inspecting is using a telescopic mast with a zoom camera on it, and this is quite good because it can get into maybe smaller areas, but it won't get into a back court, for instance. But it goes up quite high, which is an advantage, and you can zoom in to various features. It's quite good for a sort of area-based survey when you're getting a feel of the condition of roofs. But it's not so good um, possibly when you really want to get up close to something. Um, and I've got a, a small video now of such a pole camera in operation. Hello, my name is Graham Mackay from Higher Image. Today we're taking high resolution images of roofs in Rossi. The equipment we use is a 4x4 Nissan Patrol vehicle with a high resolution camera that gives us very clear detail when inspecting roofs. It's a customised rig that allows the Clark's mast to go to a height of 85 foot. The camera is uncontrolled by a power head from a laptop within the vehicle and the high resolution images can be viewed on a PC and laptop incorporating fine detail. And this is a sort of uh, result you get from a telescopic mast camera. So you can quite a lot of detail and you can zoom in to various points. But again, you can't move around the chimneys uh, unless you move the car that the, the mast is on. Um, rope access inspection using uh, abseilers or staple jacks who have got abseiling uh, training uh, are, are, are useful, uh, particularly if they've got training in uh, tenement maintenance and dealing with stone particularly. Um, there are certain advantages in using them. Obviously you don't need scaffolding. You can do things beforehand and if it's only a minor work you're checking the stone or something like that is it's quite a good way of doing it. One of the advantages is that they can combine various do small repair work on the building at the same time like limited repointing and maybe um, removing uh, stones that are coming loose. Although, you know, you probably have to put a scaffolding up if there is a loose stone and you have to do the job properly, or maybe you get a cherry picker to do that. So uh, quite useful and quite flexible. Uh, so rope access is something to be considered. Drone surveys uh, is uh, another thing. Now I'm going to have a word with uh, Victor McKay of uh, Balmore uh, Services uh, and uh, I'll ask Victor to come in now. I'm here with uh, Victor McKay of Balmore Group uh, to talk about uh, drone surveys um, and he's going to talk us through a presentation on what you could expect from a drone survey. We're a difficult access maintenance contractor. Um, my father started the business in 1984. 
as a steeplejack contractor working at height. And using the drone allows us to send up the drone. It's more cost effective and the amount of the asset we can inspect in the time we're there is far greater than what we could with a team of men. And there's also the health and safety aspect that comes with that as well. Your, your men are on the ground and they're not working at height. The drone's doing all the work for you. So the main clients we tend to deal with are kind of tier one, tier two main contractors and councils. Um, so we kind of deal with the kind of slightly larger stuff, but we do get involved with the private work as well, which would involve your tenement buildings, which I think you guys are interested in. But, I mean, the main advantages of using drones or unmanned aerial vehicles is the risk reduction. So you, again, as I said, the guys haven't had to work at height. Uh, there's no need to shut down plants or facilities, so there has been occasions where, you know, flare stacks and things like that, we can inspect the tip without having to shut down um, shut down the asset, costing a lot of money to reactivate it and deactivate it, so there's a savings there. We're getting a better overview, so <clears throat> with, uh, you know, using a plane or a helicopter to take photos at height, you'd be limited to flying at about 500 feet would be as low as you could fly at. So you're then relying on a zoom lens to get what you need. Uh, with the drone, you're uh, more in between the areas of, you know, 10 feet to 400 feet. So you're much closer to the asset. You can get much closer to it and use a high megapixel camera to capture what you need. I mean, how difficult is, is it to get a drone survey carried out? Obviously, you need approvals for that sort of thing if you're in the city. Yeah, so you've got your standard um, license, which is the standard commercial license, which um, the general kind of commercial pilots, they're not allowed to operate within 150 metres of a congested area, so that would be classed as a town, a city, things like that, without having to put in the permissions for um, you know your privacy side of things and notifying people. Um, we operate with an operational safety case, um, <clears throat> which I think there's about 10 contractors in the UK now with that, um, which allows us to operate down to five and ten metres. Um, so that allows us to go into a city centre and operate with just having to contact Air Traffic Control and Police Scotland, getting a crime reference number, um, letting ATC know that we're operating so they can let you know the police helicopters know, ambulances know we're working in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so we do get away with having to put in less permissions, and that's due to the training we've had accreditations and the type of drones we use so the drones we use have got multiple redundancies right okay i suppose it still takes a uh, uh, time to get approval to go ahead not, not really not if you've got an operational safety case in place okay. does the weather affect things yeah absolutely yes yeah. so we want to be flying where it's not um, any kind of high precipitation in the the, the air um, as soon as you get any sort of moisture on the lens, it's going to affect the image quality. So even though our drones are waterproof and we can't operate in the rain, that's more for a safety redundancy. So if you're in the air and started to shower, the drones we use have got IP ratings, which allows them to uh, come in and land safely without the motor short circuiting. And, and I suppose wind is a, another issue. Wind's a big issue as well, yeah. Um, so we generally can operate at maximum wind speeds of around 22 miles per hour would be the yeah. absolute max. Well, it'd be good to see some examples of what you would get from a drone survey if you if you can show these. Yeah. I don't know uh, if it's possible to see them on the screen. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see this example report I've put up. You see the logo at the moment, um, um, and you'll now see the kind of address of the site. Uh, the report date, the type, company, how many images, how many images we've annotated with faults. So on this occasion, there's 30. And then you've got a severity overview. So we've got three severity ones, five severity twos, six severity threes, eight severity fours and eight severity fives. So we usually, the client can customise the severity levels to how they want, but the basics of it's usually as a one would be gutter cleaning, you know, not severe. Um, and five would be a water ingress issue or um, serious health and safety concern. Um, so then got a summary. Um, so the roof requires, you know, ridge tiles pointed, replacement areas, tile replacements, uh, stone repairs, pointing works the chimney, debris to be removed to prevent injury, uh, gap sealed and variable stone sealer applied. Um, 
and then we go on to the annotation overview. So every fall that's annotated on the pictures will have an ID number for the fall. Uh, it gives you the severity level. Um, it'll then give you a summary issue of what that fault is. So, you know, ID 1800607 is a severity 5 and it's pointing required. So it must be pretty severe pointing. So it'd be a water ingress issue for it to get a 5. It then tells you that's on page 4. You can see the file name of the picture, date taken and time, the position will give you a latitude and longitude of where the drone was when it took the photo. It'll give you the overview photo and then it'll give you the zoomed in photo of every fault you annotate. And um, we also provide an online access to our software where you our drone is actually overlaid onto Google Earth so you can see where the drone was, where it took the photo, what direction. Um, with our new play payload that we have as well, it has a laser rangefinder on it. So when you take the photo, the laser takes a measurement of where the drone was and where you're pointing the camera. So you can actually mm -hmm. get the distance of where the fault was and the latitude and longitude of the fault, not just the, the location of the drone. So you can pick up quite a lot of detail, uh, although I suppose it always requires somebody to go up there and have a, you know, maybe if you can have a close inspection. Uh, yeah, so the drone's great for, you know, the initial kind of, you know, is there any major going on here? Um, obviously, what can't be replaced is getting a tradesman on the site and then his hands on it and, you know, moving things out of the way, debris, moving some tiles out of the way to, you know, inspect further and fuller. Um, but it definitely gives you a great overview of seeing exactly well, you know, on a tenement building, if you don't have a clue what you're going up to look at, then, you know, how do you scaffold that? It's going to cost you a lot of money to scaffold a full tenement. Yeah. The drone you now can narrow down the, the repairs to a tower or multiple towers, so you're saving yourself money and access costs because you're able to pinpoint where the problems are. I mean, so how, how do you do stone surveys on the elevations? Yeah, so depending on the location, um, you know, it's a bit more difficult to do elevation sometimes with tenements because you're on maybe, you know, a road or a public pathway. Um, mm -hmm. When we're doing roof inspections, we always tend to keep above the roof. So if anything does happen with the drone, it's going to land on the roof. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start doing elevations, you're then going into the area of pavements and road closures and things like that. So a lot of the time with elevations, we'll use high power zoom cameras from the ground. And just the exact same way as what we would do to the drone if it was safe. Um, but yeah, if the drone was to do and you're doing an elevation, we basically would get drawings of the building and we would zone it in zones <clears throat> and we'd then do it by level so that when you're taking the photos, you can see exactly where that photo was taken. Okay. Um, and I mean, the other thing is, I suppose you do have rope access people, so you could always send up uh, somebody to have a look yourself. I mean, yeah, I see a lot more rope access in Edinburgh, but not so much in Edinburgh in Glasgow. We do do a lot of work in Glasgow with rope access. Um, you know, we're the kind of preferred suppliers for city building, Glasgow City Council, um, and we've got a team kind of constantly doing stuff. But um, Edinburgh definitely is the kind of full of historic buildings, and it's you know it's it's got a lot a lot of money to spend on these buildings and look after them. And now finally, do you, do, you, do you use infrared cameras at all? Yeah, we use radiometrics, thermal imaging cameras. Um, so ideal for buildings which are heated um, and flat roofs. So, you know, the infrared will allow us to see where heat is escaping on a roof. And if yeah. heat is escaping, that's where water is getting in. Mm -hmm. um, with flat roof membranes, um, if there is a... You know, damage to it and the water's getting into the membrane, you can see the water almost like a kind of puddle on the roof and see exactly where it's kind of coming in from and where it's expanding to because the kind of insulation layers will actually warm the water up and make the water a different temperature to the water on the outside of the membrane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to interpret what you see. Yeah, the thermal imaging is a great, um, great for inspecting large, large roofs, large assets, because yeah. it's so easy to just do a visual inspection with a drone, and it can be a tiny little item that could be causing the water ingress, and it's very easy to miss that still with a drone survey. So the thermal imaging does pinpoint problems straight away, so that when yeah. you do go up to do the visual inspection, you can inspect that further and fuller. Thank you, Victor. You obviously get a limited view of of roofs using binoculars and that's quite useful 
but sometimes you don't get high enough to actually see very much. And that's why, you know, getting the scaffolding or uh, rope access or a drone survey is useful. Flat roofs, of course, can be inspected using a rope and harness uh, as long as there's a trap door onto the roof and access is possible. Um, and uh, you get Victorian flat roofs as well. Um, gutters and downpipes, well, you'll see these from the street, um, but it's really important uh, to sort of notice the sort of defects you get. With gutters, it's usually at the joint and you can get rebedded rebed the joints quite easily um, and then you know here we've got on the right hand side one downpipe which is serving two properties so there's too much water going down that pipe uh, and with wetter weathers due to climate change that is a problem so it's under capacity and uh, when you get that sort of thing you get a lot of moisture on the wall and then you get things like this now this is a uh, uh, a shot of a bay window uh, and I think you can see the slight bulge there sometimes it's very difficult to see these things and uh, on the right hand side it's sort of emphasized by taking away what's there but you can see the bulge well that led to the collapse of that bay and then as a result of it everybody had to move out of their house and the front wall had to come down so it was like this and it's now about to be rebuilt after i think about three years so why did that happen it wasn't just a storm it was the fact that the joists that go into the wall were rotten and the joists have a tying action between the front wall and the actual floors so in these these joists go all the way through the building front to back and they hold the tenement together. So it's very important to keep that external wall dry, as dry as possible. Now, walls will get wet in the wet weather, but they should be able to dry out. But if they don't, embedded timber will become rotten here at this joint. And that's very vulnerable. And you also get it spreading to uh, other places. So you'll get wet rot, cellar fungus, certainly in basements and lower areas, uh, which have got a lot of moisture. And you get dry rot. This is just early stage of dry rot in a ceiling. And it's, in, you know, it's been covered over, so it's very hard to see. Uh, so once one surveying firm has gotten onto this, and actually they train dogs to sniff out dry rot, now they can only sniff out dry rot, they can't sniff out wet rot, which is it's interesting. Uh, but uh, I have used them quite successfully uh, in a building. So if you don't want too much disruption, you can use uh, rot hounds and maybe a boroscope surveys to check if you, if you think you've got rot, well, that's maybe one way to, to do it. Now, obviously you can check the ground floor, see if there's a problem with rising damp and remember that most Victorian tenements had a slate DPC uh, at lower level. Um, and a lot of the time that is covered up by the ground. Uh, and here you see in the close where maybe a lot of washing of the close has led to deterioration or it might be rising damp. But I mean, the, the paintwork is, uh, not, is impermeable, so it's holding the moisture in and then spilling out. And sometimes the wrong plaster has been used. If you use gypsum and plaster, it's the wrong type of plaster to use in these places. You can always check the landings of the stairs and the treads, the balusters and the handrails. Make sure they're all secure. Nobody can fall through them. And remember the, uh, the half landings there, they're usually bedded on a timber uh, framework uh, they might have additional steel or supports in them, but there's timber in there as well. You do get cracking in the corner of closes. Maybe this one is a bit exaggerated, but that's what happens. The outer wall falls down through having greater pressure on it. And the inside brick wall is very badly bonded into the outer wall. Uh, and, you know, you can see 
here uh, there's a diagonal crack appearing at this joint uh, and that could be a problem with differential settlement so you might need a, an engineer to have a look at it and maybe some steel ties have to go in to tie the uh, front or the back wall uh, into the side close walls. In any basement, if you can get into a basement, uh, you'll often get moisture because it's largely below ground level uh, and particularly where you've old, old coal holes or uh, you know glass lay lights glass glass lights pavement lights rather and they'll have been covered over with uh, steel joists this is uh, underneath uh, an old uh, pavement light and they have put in steel beams and then concrete it over but it's rusted so badly that you know the, the corrosion is is too far gone. That'll have to be replaced. Um, s external stairs have to be safe, so somebody can fall through the here with no handrail. Uh, you might think that's not much of a fall, but sometimes it is quite a, a fall. And uh, I had I was called into one uh, West End property where they had. Uh, cast iron railings which were in poor condition and uh, a tenant had uh, gone out for a smoke and leant against the railing and fallen over and cracked their head um, and then uh, you know I had to inspect uh, the rest of the railing condition which was really poor. Now cast iron uh, isn't good under tension it's okay in compression, but it needs to be well bolted together, well fixed. And if you're getting it welded up or anything, don't use oxy. You know, don't use a, a, a electric uh, brazier. Use gas welding, uh, or and usually use a specialist. But you're better use sort of additional stays if you're concerned about it at all. Um, in this case, you know, this is the remnants of the collapsed railing and uh, the tenant is suing all the owners of that close uh, for lack of maintenance. If you do get into a, an attic space and, uh, uh, you know, this is fairly typical uh, where it's been insulated but they haven't uh, improved the ventilation into the attic. Um, so you get condensation on the underside of the sarking um, and obviously old leaks uh, that's a, a pointer to where you should be looking at but you can't really beat having a scaffold up uh, to get a close inspection safely uh, and even going up into the loft you really should take a lot of precautions and I would advise that it's only done by a professional. We'll come on to Scaffolding, when we're talking about employing a builder, but usually that's when a contract has been let and, you know, you've got a contract underway. And I think my pointer is always to allow for contingencies in the contract documents because you will always find more work to do than you first could see in a ground level or even uh, a sort of drone survey. You, there's always something else that you can't see. From the scaffold, obviously you can look closely at the chimneys because um, you can get up close to them. They're exposed to the weather so they get a lot of uh, rainfall and uh, you have to watch out that that coping is throwing water off the face of the chimney. Uh, often you know they're badly pointed uh, and then salts from the chimney except starts um, going through the stonework so that's a problem. This one's got no pots on it either. Roofing matters, well, we're going to discuss roofing matters in a different webinar later, but a few point about uh, gutters. Uh, blockages in autumn are a major problem with leaf blockages. There always should be a safety overflow. Uh, uh, and here on the picture on the right, you'll see the safety overflow. In a parapet gutter, as in on the picture on the left, um, you'll have the main outlet and you really need a good sized overflow outlet uh, just above it as well uh, and you need a big you know it needs to be big enough 
to take a deluge of water if there is a, a storm. Always clean your gutters. That's the one thing I I think is essential. Uh, particularly if you've got pigeons, because they pigeon guano allows uh, seeds to start growing into plants and plants start blocking the gutters. So it doesn't take very long for gutters to silt up. Uh, and then they overflow and then the stone underneath gets soaked. And of course that also goes into the timber, either the the roof joists and the wall plates or the immediate uh, the, the safe lintels, the timber safe lintels underneath it. You can see in this picture uh, of a cast iron moulded gutter and it's corroded at the rear because that area doesn't get painted. Uh, and then water, when it rises up in that gutter, it'll spill down the back of the gutter and soak the wall plates in the top of the corbel. And that can be a big problem. Sometimes we put an undercloak, oh, it says undercook, <laughs> under the gutter uh, in case that sort of thing happens. Glass fibre gutters are usually not strong enough to cope with snow. And obviously, if you've got flashings, uh, make sure they're maintained because that'll get into the sarking if it leaks and the sarking will become rotten. Bays and orioles, corners and turrets, you know, they're exposed. Uh, and here we've got one that is really open to the elements. And there's obviously been movement in behind there. Someone's been up with some mastic pointed, which is the worst thing you can do. Um, and that leads to water penetration. And that leads to rot in the timbers inside, particularly at bays where you have this thing called a large beam, a large timber beam, which is called a Bresimer beam across the bay and that can become rotten and and if it does usually you have to take it out and and replace it with a piece of steel a steel beam uh, again saturation of the wall is really caused by uh, poor poor downpipes either they're cracked at the back or at joints or all sorts of spillages occur uh, which will then soak the stone and leave this green mark but on the on the bottom you see this crack lintel well it suggests there's probably rot inside because when you get something like that uh, with a crack lintel uh, it's likely that the safe lintel has become rotten so the load of the inside uh, uh, wall or the, the the timber inside uh, has sunken down and transferred the load to the outer face of the wall. And this is the sort of depressing uh, feature you get with uh, wet rot or dry rot inside the safe lintel and the joists. Uh, obviously, cement pointing is not a good idea because it holds moisture uh, and doesn't let the stone breathe. And that can lead to decay, further decay of the stone. So I'll be dealing with that in a later webinar, uh, particularly uh, about stone repairs and uh, s structural work. And now I'm going to ask uh, Scott Abercrombie to join me for a discussion about uh, what to look for and general maintenance ideas. I'd like to introduce Scott Abercrombie, who's a, an accredited conservation architect uh, from our old practice, um, to the webinar. And they're going to ask him a few questions about surveying uh, tenements. Hello. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, Scott. One of the things I want to ask, what are the advantages of hiring a professional to do a tenement survey? There are a number of benefits to hiring a, a professional to carry out uh, an inspection of your property. First and, and foremost is experience and expertise, provided you employ a professional who uh, holds a conservation accreditation. You can be comfortable that the architect, surveyor or, or engineer that you're bringing on board is, is suitably demonstrated their knowledge of traditional buildings, their ability to diagnose their defects and specify appropriate repairs for them. Secondly, we're independent of the contractor, so you can be comfortable that we're not setting out to create work for ourselves. Speaking personally, we seek to adopt a, and approach a minimum intervention wherever possible although we'll obviously make recommendations for desirable work where it's sensible to carry out alongside alongside urgent repairs, such as repainting your downpipes when the scaffold's already up. We're also independent of owners, um, factors, landlords, and so on. So 
our experience has, has been that it's easier to reach consensus about the works when you've got an independent report that's been prepared and it can help to maintain good relationships between neighbours as a repairs project is taken forward. Okay, well, I mean, what would a, a, a professional survey, what would you expect it to, to contain in a survey? Well, so there's a British standard for conservation, which sets out the requirements really that a good quality condition survey should fulfil. Uh, Annex A to that sets out the conservation accreditation schemes that are currently active in the UK and um, what uh, that any professional you hire should really be accredited under. Um, and then Annex B within the within the British standard then sets out what a typical survey should contain. Um, this includes an introduction, um, which we then typically use to, to provide a guide to the report, the terms that we're going to use within it, to provide background to the, the property, such as its historical significance, whether it's located in a conservation area and so on, um, as well as information on the ownership in the building, analysis of impacts that, that might have on taking forward repairs, that sort of thing. And then the second section really should be a description of the building fabric and its condition recommendations for the repairs and other works that might be might be required at the same time and the the british standard sets out different ways of defining um these repairs so there's, there's four different terms immediate urgent necessary and desirable that make up the four different types of priority there's a final section as well which forms part of that report which should kind of give recommendations on whether there's further investigations required or the paths to taking forward work that sort of thing and, and I mean, how would you assess the life expectancy of the, the different elements? Would that be part of that process or an additional uh, uh, cost? I mean, the condition survey, it typically comments on you're, you're not necessarily assessing the life span of all the materials that are available, but you're highlighting in particular where there are issues that are likely to become more prevalent or require treatment within a kind of five-year window so you're not necessarily saying the roof is going to last another 30 years if through speaking to people on site we identify that a felt roof was last replaced 20 years ago we can comment on the fact that it might not be showing any defects at the moment but it's certainly at the end of its lifespan and that work mm -hmm. that would be expected and uh, how much would that a sort of typical survey cost i mean maybe of eight flats you know uh, close with eight flats in it yeah so i mean we the way that we approach that is we've kind of developed a tiered structure of, of of costs which are then related to the different work packages that you might have within that so a basic survey is is probably two days of work for us coming out and surveying it and then writing up the report and then we like to also i mean we feel that it's important really to always include costs with these condition reports because it's inevitably the first question that everyone asks as soon as you give them a report if you haven't included costs it's how much is it going to cost mm -hmm. so our kind of basic survey is about 1300 quid excluding VAT so that's two days of architect's time and a day for a QS to prepare an independent cost plan and then on top of that you can add another day for providing some outline drawings, a kind of basic roof plan and some basic elevations, which might highlight where repairs are. That that really depends on the type of works that you're kind of anticipating almost. Um, you can then add another 500 pounds on top of that. And that might then include something like a drone survey or a cherry picker survey, so you can get a really detailed analysis of the roof. So okay. for a kind of comprehensive survey, you're talking around about 2,200 pounds or 275 quid a flat in a, in a kind of typical eight flat tenement or for a really basic one you're down at kind of 1300 quid and 160 odd pounds uh, per flat okay so drone surveys would be extra i mean what other surveys might be required well i mean the, the typical ones that we we instruct are are a report from a structural engineer so if there's really obvious examples of structural defects, bulging walls or sagging roof lines, that sort of thing, then we would typically advise at an early stage to get a structural engineer out to comment on something like that. Mm -hmm. um, reports on things like damp and moisture within the building fabric are sometimes best involving a specialist if that's a real prevalent issue within a property. There's also further surveys that we can do, so invasive surveys that might, might make sense if you if it's important to know the build-up of a wall or if it's important to if 
it seems like there might be issues with joist ends or rafter ends and we want to see more about what's going on there. So that could either be with a boroscope or that could be breaking out small sections and kind of discrete areas in order to get a better look at the structure of the building. Do you do infrared surveys for energy or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, more and more we're doing thermography and air tightness testing to understand how the building fabric is performing. Air tightness testing is really useful for identifying where there's significant areas of air leakage. So uh, more commonly, that's related to things like boiler and tumble dryer flues these days or window installations that have been done poorly. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, thermo thermographic analysis is particularly useful where there's flat roofs in a property to identify where there might be areas of leakage. Uh, finally, uh, when, when should a sort of fabric survey be done and how frequently would you do one of these full surveys? Well, the British standard recommends every four to five years, and that's mm -hmm. been backed up by the, the Parliamentary Working Group on Tenement Maintenance. So it seems like that's probably going to become um, the regular pattern that's going to be anticipated. Now, hopefully that will be brought in with some legislation to back that up. Oh, well, thanks. Yes. So if you have a stair association, maybe that's the first thing to agree to get a five yearly <laughs> inspection. Yeah, if you're if you're setting up a common common bank account to help pay for repairs, asking people to start paying in a direct debit or of four or five quid a month might be the sort of thing that is a an easy kind of way to get start getting people on board and it'll help recover those costs in the long term. Well, th thanks very much for this, Scott. Uh, I, I think you're going to join us at the question and answer session at the end uh, of the webinar. Um, so stay with us. Will do. Um, now, I could answer some of the questions. Let's see. Douglas asks, oh, no, well, that, that's not the first one. The first one is paint on cast iron downpipes in a Georgian building, rust starting to show on the upper sides of the soil vent pipe. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you will get uh, un, an unpainted cast iron uh, rust starting, although cast iron can actually last for a very long time. So it, it, iron is, is really quite a rust proof material. Um, however, it have, ha, does have impurities and, and sometimes that will start to rust. Uh, you mainly have to really carefully brush off the rust with a wire brush. I mean, that's the first thing. That's probably more important than any finish to make sure it is cleaned down properly. Uh, and sometimes it's it's only possible to dismantle it in order to get at it properly. Otherwise, I would think something like a micaceous iron oxide uh, coat over the uh, affected area and then to prime it and then gloss paint it. Um, uh, the other one, Douglas asks about a communal repair on a chimney and he's got a leak in a flat caused by uh, many chimney defects. Well, it's hard to know if if the, the leak is caused by the chimney disrepair or the flashing around the chimney, uh, which is also a common problem. Um, if it's a flashing around the chimney, it might just be your individual repair. But if it's a whole chimney and it's a mutual chimney, you know, it, it's shared between you and the adjacent uh, close. So it might need to be rebuilt. It depends what the condition of the stonework is. Um, but uh, obviously, if you did an inspection and then sent the report to the other owners and said what you had to do, um, uh, that's the way to tackle it. Uh, it might be just needing pointed up, but it might be something more serious. Um, I think um, one of the things I would say about, uh, if Scott was here about surveying uh, stone repairs, uh, you know, whether he draws up an elevation, first of all, or whether he can use uh, a photograph to overmark it. Um, uh, because I think, uh, it's quite possible just to use a photograph and overmark it. Now, I know that planning department sometimes in, in Glasgow, uh, oh, there's yeah. Scott's baby, hello. <laughs> uh, I know planning departments prefer to see drawings. I don't know if that's because they like to see a professional involved, but I think it's perfectly adequate to have a photograph and overmark the photograph to show, as long as you've got a specification for what repairs you're going to do on that stone. 
Um, that's the simplest way of doing it, but maybe not acceptable to some conservation or planners. Uh, I think on the, the other thing on, on having a drawing that's really useful is obviously when you're getting quotes, it's far easier for the contractor to take dimensions from that and make sure that they're pricing for the right amount of stonework. Whereas particularly if you don't have, if you're using a, a mask then you can get quite accurately corrected photographs out of that, then then overmarking that by all means is 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 really useful. But if you're trying to overmark photos from the ground, it can sometimes be a wee bit more difficult to take accurate dimensions from that. And you might find that you're more likely to get variation in cost once the repairs are actually undertaken. Yeah. And uh, I, I see that Victor mentioned stone ceiling. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, not a fan. <laughs> um, no, I'm not a fan. And it's it's kind of it's working against the way that the stone is designed to work. They, I mean, you get kind of brick creams and silane treatments that are in some cases okay for for different types of brick, but I certainly wouldn't ever advise that on a on a sandstone. If anything, all you're likely to do is just trap moisture within the within the stone. So, yeah, and I I see that in his report he has a sort of rating system of one to five yeah and he had gutter cleaning as one and uh you know more serious what he thought was more serious at five well actually i think gutter cleaning should be the most serious thing <laughs> yeah i mean technically on a so the the, the bright standard that we use um obviously anything that's kind of urgent is considered within 18 months and it's and it's my view that gutter cleaning really should be an annual thing so it's kind of a perpetually urgent thing to take place really unless you've just had it done a couple of weeks before <laughs> the report's been written mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah i get what, why he's saying that because in terms of the cost implications of it and the ease of carrying it out and the kind of commonplace nature of it it's it's not a particularly serious thing from that so from a seriousness aspect it's quite minor but yes, from a, yes. and it should obviously from as you say, is arguably the most important maintenance thing to, to carry out on a regular basis. Is fitting internal insulation a good idea? <laughs> I'll ask you that, Scott. Uh, it depends on the insulation. Um, so as we were talking about there with how stone's meant to, to work, um, obviously that's meant to be breathable so there are systems out there that are designed to work with the kind of natural building physics of, of the stone so in particular wood fibre is a is a really good one to use and is, is becoming more and more kind of commonly accepted as a material so companies like MBT and things like that have kind of full systems that you can buy off them and that still allows the stone to breathe naturally so you're not creating any risks um, of trapping moisture or Actually, in some cases, the risk can be that you're stopping heat getting to the stone, which then doesn't allow water to, to evaporate out the, the external surface of the, the stone um, as well. So things like Kingspan installed internally can actually cause issues with the, the external facade if, um, if you install insulation that's too thick there. Yeah. So yeah, insulation is no, no bad thing, but um, typically, yeah, I mean, we, we're looking for something that's, that's vapor open and breathable to be installed internally and you know and to do that properly in most cases you're looking at there's a risk that you have to balance against loss of original details so um if you if you've got a property that doesn't have any cornices and the latin plaster is already taken out and all you've got is plasterboard stripping that off to install a wood fiber system is is no great loss from a kind of significance point of view but if you're looking if you've got a a listed property which the the significance of the interior is high then then insulation is is something that has to be a lot more considered and obviously yeah. a listed would require listed building consent so. i mean obviously you can use these very thin uh space therm insulants um and also yeah, I mean, I mean, other systems like historic scotland have obviously been been more and more experimenting with injecting bead in behind lath as well yes. um, and that's still a, a kind of vapor permeable system, um, but it's not one um, that I think we've tried as a practice and monitor yet. Yeah, yes, yes, maybe more risky. Um, is there any way easier to clean the back of a gutter other than scaffolding? Well, you have to get at the back of the gutter somehow. I mean, I'm assuming 
the back of the gutter is high up, so you'll you'll need a scaffold tower at least. Um, uh, I don't know how high the the gutter is, but uh, you need access to it. I don't think there's a simple answer to that one. I think I I, I, I think internal insulation is a, a pressing point, and we're going to have a, a webinar on energy efficiency later in the series. Uh, and I'll be up speaking to somebody like Barbara from the office uh, about that. But uh, it's, it's obviously not just Victorian properties that get insulated. Sometimes it's more modern properties. I mean, even things from the 60s, 50s and 60s need insulation. Uh, yeah, cavity insulation can be done in, the, in those cases. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes internal insulation is, is the answer if it's a solid wall. So... Uh, particularly for stone tenements, yeah, I guess, is the answer. Um, no other questions. Oh, dear. <laughs> we put everybody off. <laughs> oh, here's a question. Oh, good man. Sarah, views on replacing lead with fiberglass on the roof. Um, well, first of all, yeah, if, if, if it's going to be stolen, then maybe there's an alternative. There are materials, and I, I've got this on the roof above here, uh, using a thing called liquid plastics, um, which goes over an insulated uh, uh, insulation. Uh, and it, it's really quite flexible, but it has to be re-coated maybe every 20 years. So um, that's, that's one thing to do. And glass fiber has been used in sort of uh, dormer roofs and that sort of thing. But uh, you have to make sure that there's ventilation underneath it. You know, you, you have to be careful about that because you get a buildup of moisture condensing on the underside, just like on a lead roof, you need to ventilate underneath it. The thing about lead, if you, you really want it to last, lead is the answer mostly, but make sure you have a lead contractor, somebody who's trained in in using lead because so often people say they can do lead, but they actually haven't got the knowledge or the training in laying it. So they might choose the wrong weight of lead. They don't have the right fixings of the lead or the distances where the joints are or steps in the lead. All of this has to be done properly. Uh, and if you beat lead, at any, you know, can make it thinner and thinner, and that that is a problem. Make holes in it, so make sure you get the right person to do it. Uh, we have a flat in an A-listed building which requires repairs to its lantern. The factor has collected three quotes for repair work, but none is from a conservation company. Uh, should we be pushing for this qualification? Uh, I think it's not so much that the quotes aren't from a conservation company. It's that who prepared the specification and what what sort of design is it? Because I think if it's A-listed, you wouldn't be putting uh, plastic uh, transoms or even aluminium ones. You can get uh, cames or, you know, lead uh, cames on uh, uh, steel uh, back, which, which go over the wood joists that are there at the moment uh, and then put toughened glazing over that. So I think as long as the specification is prepared by a conservation accredited surveyor or architect, then it's OK to go to, uh, you know, any company as long as they can uh, meet that specification. Uh, Liz Smith, what is the difference between a survey and inspection? <laughs> well, I sort of use them uh, uh, independently. Uh, I mean, there's not really, you have to inspect in order to do the survey and a survey is an inspection. You know, it's just, they're used. I shouldn't have used them interchangeably. Uh, in Scotland, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> What is the difference between a survey and an in inspection? I, John, I'm guilty of the same as you of using the two, two terms interchangeably. Um, the the British standard refers to it as an inspection. 
So, okay. but, I mean, we well, I, presumably I, you have to inspect it first, and then you write down the survey report. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Not so, really. in, in the, each item might be an inspection. So, inspected the chimneys, the gutters, and, yeah. and then the total of it adds up to a survey. Any info on pavement sellers? I suspect they're causing water ingress in my tenement. Yeah, they probably are. Um, I mean, they, if you've got a, a basement, then it might be prudent to have a sump drain in the basement with a pump uh, to pump water out because it may be lower than the drain. Uh, always a problem with uh, sellers. Um, and I, I might deal with that when we come to the uh, webinar on uh, roofs and uh, gutters and downpipes, and we'll be talking about drainage there. I mean, I think uh, just uh, on the A-listed repairs to the lantern, I'm happy to have a look at the quotes you've been sent uh and i'll tell you what i think of them <laughs> uh what's this oh, no that's it sir info and papers sorry basement flats have dpc but close has wall damp yeah well the the basement flats maybe have a, an injected dpc uh and anything below that will be damp yes the walls will be damp and I don't think you can do much about that. You can tank walls, but it's expensive. Uh, and usually if you tank the walls inside, you know, that is sort of line them with a, a membrane, uh, you still have to allow a, uh, the water to get out somehow. So you might have a drain at the bottom of that, and that goes into a sump, and then the sump pumps the water out. So um, it, it's not easy. Um, but it is possible. If I mean, you're if you're creating or creating a, a flat out of a basement, then you have a, quite a lot of work to do. Oh, Scott's gone offline. <laughs> okay. Well, there's no more questions, so I think uh, there will be. Uh, I think there's a handout which has links to the website, which you you might be able to use uh, under oneroof.scot. And also we'll be making a recording of this and we'll cut out the the uh, fiasco at the beginning, I hope, uh, so that other people can um, uh, watch it. There's one last question there about conservation street lamps that came oh, in. Oh, I didn't see that one, sorry. Uh, where do you get conservation street lamps for Edinburgh? Probably someone like Ballantines. They've got a lot of the... Um, the existing casts from the kind of well yeah was the Edinburgh library. conservation new uh new town conservation committee probably sometimes they have a store or they used to have a store for these things but uh, they would tell you where to get them um i don't know is the answer um we could try and find out but i, I don't know at the moment sorry Okay, so I'm going to finish the webinar. Thank you for coming on, Scott. Appreciated. I need someone to talk to. <laughs> okay. Okay, Petra, you can come back on and we'll say goodbye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>